If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians again, chapter 12. Last Sunday we talked about a word of wisdom. And in the same verse, I think it's, I better look here, verse, what is it, verse 8? Yep, verse 8. It talks about a word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Can I, can I just tie two things together? Uh, the, the, the reason the word of wisdom comes first is because knowledge is worthless without wisdom. It doesn't matter how much you know if you don't have wisdom. If you don't have wisdom, then forget the knowledge. God could share something with you, but if you don't have wisdom on how to use it, you'll use it wrong. The, the two are tied together, okay? So uh, whenever, if you pray for a gift from, of the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, just for an example this morning, you know, when, when, when I said, and, and this was not planned, so, but when I said I felt like there were people here with some needs and hands went up, that's kind of a word of knowledge, okay? Kind of ties to that. It gets a whole lot deeper than that, though, because I've seen it where the word of knowledge read people's mail, and there's no way they could know that. Can I, can I scare you a little bit? Okay. The Holy Spirit knows every detail about your life. Every detail. Not everybody here knows every de detail, but the Holy Spirit knows every single little detail that you might not want everybody to know. Okay? So, when you pray, Lord, help me, <laughs> the Lord's going to help you. He might share with somebody else what it is you don't want anybody to know. He might. Now, it's up to them to have wisdom on how to use that, and they better be listening to the Holy Spirit, because if they use it wrong, then God forgive them. But if they use it right, the reason God shares it is to help you. Okay? That's why they're so tied together. But we're going to read it, okay? If you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to start with verse 1. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Okay? That means if, if you're saying, proclaiming Jesus is Lord, then that's the Holy Spirit sharing that fact with you. Okay. He goes on. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, the gifts of the Spirit are not for, for your good, they're for the church is good. Now, don't take that wrong because th this is where people get messed up. It's not for just in here, church is good. It's for the good. Boom, outside the church, okay? Not just inside the church. So the gifts of the Spirit are, are a gift to reach out to the world. Verse 8, it says, For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Okay? So the word of knowledge. Word of knowledge... Uh, I've seen it abused, and I've seen it used by God in great ways. Sometimes God gives you a, I read a story about a guy, a pastor, and 
his wife came to him and said, you know, the Lord just shared with me that one of our board members is having an affair. Okay, so they didn't just walk right up to him and say, you're having an affair. Because see, this is where the wisdom starts to come in, okay? Uh, the pastor looked at his wife and said, let's really pray about this one, okay? Let's really pray about it. If this, if, if this is happening, then let's pray that God would reveal it. So later that same week, the couple calls, husband and wife, call the pastor and say, there's something we really need to talk to you about. And it was the man that he was, he was talking to. And the pastor said, is it about the affair you're having with your secretary? And he's like, how did you know? See, there was the moment. And that's where the two tie together. The Holy Spirit wants to give us knowledge for his use, not for ours. See, that's the gifts of the Spirit are abused when it becomes about me. Maybe downing somebody, pushing somebody, lifting myself up. That, that's not what the gifts of the Spirit are for. They're not, they're not there to make me look good. They're, they're here to, to, to bring praise and glory to the name of Jesus. Amen? I mean, that's all they're for. So you, you might think, okay, the, these gifts of the Spirit weren't in the Old Testament. No. I'm going to give you an example of a word of knowledge in the Old Testament. Okay? 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. One of my favorite stories, okay, in the Bible. Love this story. Elisha. At this time, Israel wasn't a great country because of sin. They were starting to fall under others. And one of the great countries at that time was a country named Syria. And Syria, had, whose commander, the commander of Syria, the Syrian army, was a man named Naaman. Naaman, this great warrior, had one problem. He had leprosy. That's a pretty bad problem. In those days, uh, it, you usually weren't a commander of an army, but this is Syria. If it was in Israel, he would have been pushed out. But in Syria, he was still a commander of army, but everybody stayed away from the general because, man, he had leprosy. So a, a servant girl in Naaman's house, uh, a prisoner girl, Jew. <laughs> This must have been a very good family to the servants because this servant girl cared about her, her boss. And he said to, the, said to Naaman's wife, he said, hey, there's a, there's a prophet in Israel that heals people. He should, Naaman should go there. So Naaman goes to his king and tells him what he wants to do. And the king writes a letter to the king of Israel. And gives him a lot of money and things. And so Naaman travels all the way to, to Israel. And then he goes into the throne room of Israel. And he presents the letter and all these gifts to the king of Israel. <laughs> the king of Israel, I can't heal people. What? And he, he, he feels like he was, like this is a threat against his kingdom. He immediately takes it personal because he's like, so he rends his clothes. Like, man, we're in trouble now. The king of Syria is trying to make war and there's no way we can beat him. And he sends his general here and says, heal me. And I can't heal anybody. I'm just a king. And, but Elisha hears about that and says, send him to me. So Naaman and all his, his followers, and it says they were chariots. So we're, we're a bunch of chariots hit the road and head to Elisha's house. Okay, we're going to join the story right there. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger to him. Go, say, saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Number one, Naaman is insult, insulted. Okay? Naaman is insulted. He is a general. He is the leader of all of Syrian army, and this prophet won't even come out and talk to him. He sends a servant to come outside and go, 
go dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. Number two, the Jordan River is muddy. He goes, we have better rivers in Syria. Why would he want me to go dip in some muddy river? And it was another servant who said, well, well why don't you just try it? It can't hurt to try. And so Naaman and his group travel all the way to the Jordan River. Naaman gets out. And he dips himself seven times in the Jordan River. And when he comes out the seventh time, he is cured of leprosy. So, Naaman travels back with his chariots back to uh, Elisha's house. And says, man, I'm healed. Here's all the stuff. I want to give you all the stuff. And Elisha said, I don't want your stuff. I don't want your stuff. Go. Just go and I'm glad you're healed. So Naaman heads off, but Na Elisha's servant Gehazi, he, he decides, man, this is an opportunity for me. And he follows Naaman, catches up with him, and says, you know, Elisha just had some, I want you to notice the wording, how Gehazi says this. It sounds religious. You know, he, he made it sound good. Um, Elisha just had some guests show up and he has nothing to give them. You know, could we have like a, a couple of things of clothes and some, a little bit of money and, you know, just, just to take care of these guests? Elisha would really appreciate it. And so, uh, Naaman gives it. So Gehazi goes back thinking, score! You know, I just, I just came out of this with a ton of stuff. Goes back to the house, walks in. Word of knowledge comes into play. Verse 25, chapter 5. Gehazi, it says, he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. Here's the word of knowledge. But he said to him, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards, vineyards, sheep, oxen, male servants, female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. Word of knowledge, man. The Holy Spirit spoke to Elisha and he knew exactly what Gehazi was doing. Exactly. I mean, that, that is, that's how the word of knowledge works. It is, it is there for you and I to be used of God. Not, not for us. It's never there for your glory, for your, just to bail you out. It's there for him to get the glory. There are times people need some knowledge. You know, you, you might think, well, this was harsh, man, him and his family. And, but if you know anything about no, no Old Testament law, sin got passed down to generation. The generational curse can be broken if someone in that family surrenders to God and really serves God, the curse gets broken. So don't sit there and think, well, man, that was a really harsh curse to all of Gehazi's kids, man. <laughs> That's a really harsh judgment. No, what it was is he was saying, this is what happens to anybody who lies and tries to manipulate God. Word of knowledge. It didn't just stop there. Jump in the New Testament. Acts. Probably the most famous one in Acts. Acts, kind of odd. 2 Kings chapter 5, Acts chapter 5. Very well-known story of... Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira were church members. Like, they attended church like you guys. Yeah. But, and, and I, I'm, I, I got, I'm trying to be careful how I say this. Okay. But I'm going to be blunt. So if you get your feelings hurt, I'm sorry. But I'm not. Okay. Um, there's a lot of people who go to church who aren't Christians. They go to church to somehow earn their way to heaven. Can I, can, I, can I tell you something? You don't earn your way to heaven. This is the only religion in the world where you can 
not earn your way to heaven. It's by grace you're saved through faith. It's the gift of God, period. That's what scripture says. Amen? It is. That means I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Not just my Savior, He becomes my Lord. That's a little different than just my Savior. I know a lot of times it gets worded that He just saved me. But He, he didn't just save me. He, he's allowed me to come into a relationship with Him where He becomes Lord of my life. This was happening in this church. A real good, move, great move of God was happening. And, and people were, were uh, just moved by the Spirit to give. I mean, they'd sell property and give it away to, to go to missions or to go to, to feed the hungry or they, they heard of somebody in need and, and they had extra and they'd give it. So this great thing was happening. I, Ananias and Sapphira sold some property and decided, hey, we could, we could look good in front of everybody by giving this great amount of money but hold some back. Nobody will ever know. See, that, the problem with the nobody will ever know thought and I know you've had this when you've been tempted nobody will ever know God always knows period always there is no, nothing hidden to God true I mean all you gotta do is read that if he's truly God I'm sorry you can't hide anything from him he sees it he knows it in fact he knew you'd do it before you did it cause he's God so here's all these, you know, here's these two people who sell this property and, and they're really, their goal was to look good in front of everybody else. They weren't, they didn't do this to be blessed by God. See, there, there was the difference. They did it to look good. That's, that is the divider in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and the blessing of God. You don't give to get attention. You give because God wants you to give. Amen? It doesn't matter that anybody knows it. In fact, it's better if nobody does. It's better if nobody knows how much you gave. Nobody's aware. It, it doesn't matter that anybody knows. It only matters that he knows. And he knows everything. He knows the reason we do things. That's the problem. Sometimes the reason we do things is not the right reason. This was done, and a lot of money might have come to the church but it was done for the wrong reasons. And so Ananias shows up in church with the big check. Bang. Peter, bless you, brother. You know, and Peter takes the check. And then the word of knowledge hits. Why is it that you have put it in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? See, because you're not lying to the church, you're lying to God. This is, the, this is the difference. He was literally lying to God. When you lie, you're not, you're not lying to protect yourself. You're lying to God. Did you know that? Every time I sin, it divides me from God. It's, not, it's an act against God when I sin. It's not an act that's for me or for anybody's benefit. That's the, the enemy likes to lie, like to lie to us about lying. It sounds funny, doesn't it? But he does. That uh, we lie to protect others. Oh, you, you know, you, gotta, you can't tell them the truth. It'll hurt their feelings. Have you ever had that? Come on, come on. Haven't you ever had that? You can't, you can't tell them the truth. It hurt their feelings. Well, you can't lie either. There's sometimes you just don't say anything. <laughs> okay? And there's sometimes you have to have that wisdom to use the knowledge. So Ananias says this. And uh, I'm going to pull this wire up because it's bugging me. Do you guys get bugged by anything? Do you ever get bugged by anything? Never? I don't know if I believe you. Was that a lie? <laughs> Okay, we'll just go away from that. We don't want you to feel guilty or anything. But Ananias says this, and immediately Peter says, why have you decided to lie to the Holy Spirit? And the Bible says that he falls over dead. Right there. The, the 
terrible thing is not long after that, here comes Sapphira. She walks in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter says, why have you and your husband agreed together to lie to God? The same people that carried your husband out are here to carry you out. And she drops out dead. You don't mess with God. I don't know where, why this world thinks they can, they can mock God. God is not mocked, the Bible says. God is patient, not wanting any to perish, wanting all to come to repentance, but God is not mocked. God is not lied to. God is not used or manipulated with. The, the gifts of the Spirit are not there for our glory or to lift up the church. They're to lift up the name of Jesus. Always. Every gift of the Spirit is about Him. And, and when God uses us, it's for His glory and for His praise, not ours. But God wants to use everyone. Seriously. It's not for just for pastors or leaders. It's not just for Ann. It isn't. God wants to use others. He wants us to be, to, in fact, he closes out 1 Corinthians chapter 12 saying earnestly desire the gifts. Earnestly seek them. He closes out the chapter saying seek them all. That God would use you. And, and so you think, well, once I get this gift, it's mine. No. It's his. That's when, I, when, when people tell me, you know, that they're a prophet. There's part of me that just kind of goes, ouch. Because while God might prophesy through you, he didn't just lay it on you and say, it's yours. You might pray for people and they're healed. That doesn't mean you're a healer. He is. He used you. But that doesn't mean I can walk up to anybody else and just touch them and they're going to get healed. I got to listen to the Holy Spirit because he's the healer. But he wants to use me. So this is where word of wisdom and knowledge come together. You and I have to be listening to the Holy Spirit. It's, it's what God wants us to do 24-7 that we're listening to God and when he leads us, we do it. Problem is, there's, there are two voices in our heads. Well, actually, three. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. So that's one. The other voice is yours. And the third is the enemy. You have to learn to decipher who's who. Now, I, I've learned to recognize voices on the phone. So have you. There are certain voices that have called you enough that as soon as you hear your voice, their voice, you go, hey, and you say their name, right? Because you know it. So like if Devin's called you enough, you'd go, hey, Devin, as soon as he'd say hello, you'd go, Devin, how you doing? You, he wouldn't have to say his name, you'd know it. There's some people that have called me and expect me to just know the, who they are. And they just start talking. And I'm like, who are you, who are you, who are you, who are you? Have you ever had that happen? Come on. Somebody calls you, they don't say who they are, they just start talking. And you're like, who are you? I mean, I mean I'm, my brain is just like going, checking, going through all the names, you know. I, is it somebody in my church? I don't know, I don't know. And, and, and you, you keep waiting for some detail to pop out that will kind of go, oh, I know who you are, you know. So you don't have to be embarrassed, which I have done a few times and went, who are you? Because I don't know. And, and, and enough conversations went by where I, you know, I am clueless. Clue me in. You know, I, I don't know. But after I've talked to him enough times, I begin to recognize the voice. You get where I'm going? The Holy Spirit talks to you all the time, but you need to learn to recognize his voice. And you need to learn to recognize the devil's. You need to know who he is and what he's doing and what he's saying. Because he's a liar. Amen? He's a liar. He lies. He manipulates scripture. He always has. I mean, all you have to do is read how he tempted Jesus. 
He took scripture, only he just took part of it, and he took it out of context, and it turns into a lie when you take it out of context. Jesus would quote it back to him, reading the above and the beyond and, and, and below, and that would clear it up. You need to learn to recognize, see, this is where wisdom comes from. Where you get to the place, I recognize who's who. And when the Holy Spirit speaks, I'm not afraid to act. Because some of us, we're so unsure what the Holy Spirit is saying, we don't act on it. We don't know. Is that God? I'm afraid. I don't want to look like a fool. I mean, sometimes God tells us to do something, and, and it's, it's scary. You know, I've told the story many times how I had to pray for that one lady, and I didn't want to pray that way because... Well, we're, we'd already prayed for her. And when God wanted me to yell in the name of Jesus now, well, that, if nothing happens, that's embarrassing. Okay? Your pride steps in. And you, is this me or is this God? Because if it's me, <laughs> Vern, you're really going to look like an idiot. You've got to learn to divide and get to recognize who God is. Because right now, God is talking to each and every one of us. That's the truth. The Holy Spirit is talking to us. And if we listen, God can change us to make us like him. If we're not listening, if we're doing what we want to do, if we're listening to the wrong voices, we're going to end up going down the wrong path. There are churches full of people who are headed down the wrong path because they're listening to the wrong voice. The Holy Spirit the Bible's pretty clear, it's soft. Still. It's a small voice. I, I've never had God yell at me. Never. But he's spoken to me quietly quite a few times. All the time. Almost all the time he's talking to me. There's sometimes I'm too busy to catch it. And there's other times I'm like, yes, yes. I get that, Lord. So, you know, like it, during, in the service, you'll notice something happen when in the middle of worship, we're worshiping the Lord, okay? But it's always after worship or when there's a quiet time that a message in tongues comes. You notice that? That's because they've been, they've been feeling this thing coming on, but because of the wisdom that God gives them, they wait because God is a God of order. God, and, and God says, now, now. And, and when you learn to listen, boom, you do it. Because you know it's what God wants me to do now. See, God wants us to have the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge functioning in our lives, even at work. Where I can minister into somebody's life at work, on the street, in the store. We need to pray that God speaks to us that we can minister. There are people who need Jesus every day that we meet. And they need to hear from God. They don't need to hear from me. But man, if the Holy Spirit's speaking through me. Boy, you, anything can happen. Man, powerful things can happen. Conviction can happen. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is truth. And when he speaks, he knows everything, every detail. As we sit here right now, God knows every detail of what's going on in your life, in your mind, in your heart. He knows exactly where you're at. Exactly. It is up to you to surrender. And say, God, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And, and, and there's so many times in our life where the Holy Spirit speaks to us and we listen and we start to follow God. But then we go, we, we get used to it. And then suddenly the enemy starts, we start listening. We get confused and start listening to other voices because the enemy starts talking things. And we start confusing between the two. And pretty soon we're doing the wrong thing. Uh, 
<laughs> All this stuff starts to pop into my head of, of, of how we can do that, do the wrong thing. Because uh, there's a song by, uh, I can't even remember their name right now, it doesn't matter, but Slow Fade. So it doesn't matter what the name of the group is, and some of you are just immediately went boom. But I'm old, and so I forget. Okay. Uh, but anyway, um, slow fade. That is the way the enemy works. He doesn't work fast. He slowly pulls you away from listening to God so that you can get to the place where you actually think it's God talking to you, and it's not. I had somebody tell me once, God told me that it's okay that I don't go to church. And I'm like, well, that's weird because that would go against the Bible. And I don't think God goes against his word. In fact, I'm pretty sure he doesn't. In fact, I know for a fact he doesn't. So who are you listening to when you say that? Seriously, who? Who? I've had people tell me that it's okay. The Lord told me it was okay for them to divorce their wife and run off with another woman. I'm sorry, the Bible does not say that. If it does not agree with the word of God, then it's not God, okay? It's got to agree with the word of God to be God. God does not lie. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if it's God, it goes with the word of God. Amen? It doesn't go against it. That's why when people say, you know, they come to us in this day and age and they say, homosexuality isn't sin, God has changed. I'm like, when does it say that? Where in the Bible does it say that God changes at all? God doesn't change. He hates sin. He hates it. In fact, the Bible's clear he can't even look at sin. If sin is in my life, it separates me. It throws up a wall between me and God. In fact, even by, the Bible even says that he doesn't hear my prayers. Scary, huh? But that's exactly where the enemy t- wants to take us, to a place where the enemy is the voice we're listening to instead of God. Church, I want to challenge you. Seek the Lord, the Bible says, while he may be found. Seek him. Because he's always seeking you. Always. All you have to do is reach out for him. All you have to say is, Lord, help me. Help me. I'm not making it. And man, the Lord, will get, he'll start to speak to you. The Lord wants to fill you with the spirit to a point where He's using you in the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge. But it takes you surrendering to him first. Number one, you have to surrender. When you surrender, God takes over. Amen? So, here's another thing. Just to add on to the end. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you, Steve, for a second. I hope it's okay. No, you don't get mad at me. Somebody said something at men's Bible study the other day, and, and, and it's, a, it's a word we use in the old Pentecostal circles. Um, filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and we, 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 we have, when we say that, we literally are thinking, uh, well, then he spoke in other tongues. So that means... It gives the idea, though, that someone else has more of the Holy Spirit than someone else. Doesn't it? Without even inf- saying it. And, and then Steve said, I, I don't know if I believe that. I believe that we're all filled with the Holy Spirit when we're saved. But we, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us in different levels. That was right on. When you're saved, you give your heart to the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and life. But when, when, but there are things the Holy Spirit wants to use me in and I have to give up control of me for him to do it. That, that's, that's the point. And you have to stop trying to control everything and let God control it. Amen. 
That's, that's the point. That's what we talk about the gifts. God wants us to seek them. So if we're going to seek them, then we have to stop saying, I want control. And I have to start, Lord, I want you to control me completely. And that means I'm not going to set up any lines or saying, God, you can't do this. You can't do that, God. I want you to use me, period. And he will. Amen? Amen. He will. If you just let him. Because right now he's speaking to you. If you just listen. Let's all stand, could we?